And tonight on The Daily Wrap, new revelations that the Obama administration had secretly expanded another NSA program. The details straight ahead. Rick Perry becomes the 10th Republican to jump into the race for the White House. Is this a second chance to make a first impression? And a shocking new poll out tonight says 7 in 10 Democrats say Hillary winning the nomination ain't no sure thing. 7 in 10. We discuss all of that, plus potluck and yay and nay. This is The Daily Wrap, live from New York City. And welcome, everybody. I'm Joe Concha, along with my co-host. He is a Sirius XM radio host and senior political columnist for Forbes. He is Rick Hunter. Good evening. Good evening, to sir. To one and all. <laughs> and to his right, assistant online editor for Commentary Magazine, Noah Rothman in the Heather Hansen seat. Thank you very much. Wearing it well. And finally, he is the editor of thewisdomdaily.com, and you're not. Rabbi Brad <laughs> Hirschfield is here. Good to be here. SNL steel. All right, it's time for the Daily Download. And just as the NSA begins to wind down the bulk collection of Americans' phone records, there is a new report out tonight that the Obama administration secretly expanded another NSA program. According to the New York Times, documents leaked by Edward Snowden show the Justice Department gave the NSA the okay to monitor Americans' international internet traffic. It was all a part of an effort to catch overseas hackers. The agency was permitted to monitor only addresses and cyber signatures that could be tied to foreign governments. But the documents also indicate that the NSA was looking to target hackers even in cases it could not establish links to foreign powers. The Obama administration is defending the surveillance, saying it's a matter of protecting Americans from the activities of foreign governments. But critics charge that the issue is not clear-cut and should be subject to public debate. Is this something that we should have debated, Mr. Rothman? Oh, we're debating it now. Good uh, point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I certainly uh, think that it's not uh, out of the realm of uh, reasonableness to to want to have a public debate about these sort of issues. But also that when we're d when we're talking about anti espionage. Uh, which is what this is. If we're talking about foreign governments, we're talking about anti-espionage. And in order for us to have a public debate about that, you really neutralize the capability to monitor individuals who who would be subject to that sort of monitoring and who, who we're trying to catch. So it's sort of a self-defeating process. Uh, we can have that discussion now because we're pretty much sure that whatever capabilities we're talking about are no longer the primary ca capabilities that we're, we're going to be using uh, to catch individuals who might be a problem. Rick, on your radio show, you say that this is a very hot topic, that this oh is yeah. something that Americans, maybe I give more credit for caring about. Well, what do people like to talk about most people, when it comes to these sort of stories? People are, are understandably very concerned about their rights. They, they struggle with the question of how much should be sacrificed in the name of security versus how important it is to hang on to what is given us in the Constitution. Look, you know, the best argument I always hear is what are we fighting for? What we really want to defend are the rights that we have as Americans, which are special. If we are willing to trade those off in, in response to somebody who wants to come and take them from us, well, we've kind of, as the saying goes, the terrorists win. We've given up those rights. Now, obviously, you can go too far in either direction. So at the end of the day, this is all about the balancing act. Where government can help is to be a little bit more transparent. Look, if this operation they're running is really all about people who are trying to break into our computers, I probably am not troubled by that. I want them to catch people who are doing that. But if they're collecting other data as part of it, and they're logging it, if they're cataloging it, if they're using it in other ways, then we should be concerned. Now, Brad, you're, you're the long-lost evil brother of Saul from <laughs> Homeland, <laughs> of course, Mr. Mandy, right? Yeah, I can never pronounce his last name. Patinkin. Patinkin. Thank nice you. Nice guy, by the way. Nice guy. Yeah. And people watch shows like that, and they see the way surveillance is done there, which is completely outside the law in most right. cases, particularly when, when Carrie's involved. So all that said, I, I wonder if Americans are a little bit more open towards that compromise of more increased aggressive surveillance because they see what the enemy is like, even if it's fictional, and say, boy, we're up against a real monster. So I think like a lot of situations, people love the idea of effective, intense surveillance of other folks yeah. <laughs> and then get very nervous about themselves, which I think is incredibly naive. The way this works, and to Noah's point, you do trade out certain freedoms and certain transparency if we really are at war, which is clear that we are. And if that's going to be the case, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the right. bathwater. But let's put it in perspective. There is much more metadata gathering done in the name of commerce than the government could ever do. Hmm. And I'll give you one very clear example. Furniture coasters. 
Right. Turns out that if you know what those are and yes. you use them, you know, the little disc that you put under the legs of your so you don't scratch, don't scratch floor. the floor. Ah, yeah. you care about your floor? You are more likely to have a high credit rating. So it turns out that <laughs> all kinds of businesses <laughs> measure whether or not you have furniture coasters because then well, they can don't. circumvent the obligation to alert you that they've checked on your credit score. My point is that there are ways to get around all this. And the truth is, if we're going to worry about that, then we can come back to worrying about how other countries may be trying to destroy but us. Let's put it in perspective. We don't worry about the furniture coasters and our credit scores being known. I would worry more about that because that can't get us dead and give greater latitude to the government unless deep down this really is a litmus test about whether or not you trust the government. Well, we have, that's to, we have to be a little bit careful. I, I agree with you guys you know, when it comes to the balancing act and everything else. But this government, our government, has a history of overreacting. And all you have to do is go back to World War II and look at the Japanese internment the camps, camps yeah. to know how we are capable as a people yeah. of going too far and screwing up really badly. That shouldn't have happened. We have to be cautious, and I'm not saying it's the same thing. I see the look on Noah's yeah. face, but, but it, it is the same when it, yeah, it is the same when you go too far and you're not being mindful of what you really. What need we would to agree, do. fear is a bad place yes. in which to make policy, yes. but aggressiveness is not, especially if you're engaged in the battle. Noah, last word. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're about to touch on a subject, I think, coming up, which is the re probably one of the justifications for why we have. The collection of metadata, the collection of pings and bounces, and we're not really talking about anything that is an abuse of your privacy here. We're talking about individuals who might be subject to something just a little bit more intensive than monitoring their contacts with foreign governments. And there's a real reason for that, because it's not just that we're at war in, with, in, with a terrorist entity, but we're engaged in, a, in an in espionage war, and we always there's have no and always question. will be right. with That's a variety right. of foreign governments. No Thank question. you, by the way, for that segue. That was perfect. You see, think we were going <laughs> to talk about it. We you knew it was coming. We are going <laughs> to talk about it. <laughs> we are going to talk about it. Right. And it's disturbing, really. <laughs> a, a news breaking now of a massive hack of possibly every federal agency. That's not confirmed, but that's what we're hearing. As many as four million federal employees' personal information may be in the hands of the Chinese, the Russians. Again, we don't have that confirmed, but there certainly was a massive hack, Noah, that happened. Yeah, this is uh, something that has been going on for the better part of, I would say, a decade, probably longer. Um, in Why the is it important? The international environment, right, is anarchic. Mm -hmm. There is no law that governs that. There is deterrence and mutual deterrence. And that's the extent of, the, of that which governs your behavior. In the cyber field, there is no deterrence. And as a result, we've had a real hot cyber war going on throughout, uh, between allies and adversaries for the better part of, I think, a decade. And you have moments like these that kind of leak out. Uh, but there's a lot more that is just a little bit more subtle that's constantly ongoing. We are constantly under attack from, from Russian and Chinese sources. And I would venture that we're constantly attacking them. Uh, this, is, this is something that is just a, a feature, a facet of modern international diplomacy. Brad, what do they gain? I guess it's a blackmail type of situation where now they have information on federal employees, whether it be their personal information, family information. I, I get the more data, the more ways to slice it and dice it. That's number one. Number two, that sense of vulnerability. Who hasn't had a break-in? or their house, you know, their house vandalized. That feeling of vulnerability you can create. This is millions of people, as many as four million employees. So I think Noah's right. The only way to deal with this, because you can do some security measures, is to think of this like nuclear weapons and go back to the days of mutually assured destruction. The Chinese and the Russians would need to know, you crash us, you rob our citizens of their identity, the same thing will happen But to the you. problem is, what if they can absorb that? And I think that that's a factor that they've already calculated. They yep. can absorb that kind of a deterrent. And we've got to up the ante and figure out what they can't absorb, and that's got to be the response. And we do have one more story to get to. That's uh, meanwhile, the Pentagon is warning its anthrax scare will continue to grow. Right now, the military says it's aware of at least 51 instances where live samples of anthrax were sent to labs across the U.S. in three foreign countries over the past decade. That number will likely rise. Samples of the deadly virus were supposed to have been killed by radiation before shipment, but for some reason, the anthrax remained alive. Pentagon officials are trying to assure the public that there's no danger. We believe that the risk is <coughs> zero for the general public, as well as for the people who have handled this box. Now, the story isn't exactly inspiring confidence, is it? Quickly, Brad. No, but it's low concentration. There's anthrax in the, in the ground, so no one should freak out right now. Okay, we'll be talking about this, I'm sure, in the coming days and weeks. Anyway, coming up next is ISIS social media team, the most dangerous part of their organization. Stay right here.
And welcome back to The Daily Wrap. I'm Joe Concha, along with my co-host, Rick Unger, Noah Rothman, and Bradley Hirschfield, the family of an ISIS-inspired terrorist suspect, suspect. Excuse me, ISIS and suspect don't really go well together in the English language. Shot and killed by authorities in Boston is calling for a thorough and transparent investigation. Their lawyer says the officers involved didn't have a warrant. The FBI says Usama Rahim and his nephew talked about beheading police officers. And they say Pamela Geller, who organized that Draw Muhammad contest in Texas last month that didn't end so well, was also a target. They're coming after me for violating the Sharia, for violating the blasphemy laws. And they mean to come after everyone that doesn't abide by, voluntarily, the blasphemy laws under Islamic law. Now, Geller, who now says she's guarded 24 hours a day, says she won't back down. But former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani says there's got to be a better way for her to make a point about Islam. She's not doing it in the right way. Does she have the right to do it that way? Absolutely. Should she be doing it that way? I would advise her to do it in a different way. And apparently everybody was on CNN this morning. Authorities say Rahim became radicalized by ISIS propaganda on social media. Intelligence officials say social media represents a new front and challenge in the fight against ISIS. Can this be controlled, Brad Hirschfield? Controlled in the sense that we'll just fix Twitter and Facebook and we'll be safe from ISIS? No, that's a fantasy. Can we do certain things like get... Uh, Twitter to stop broadcasting people being burned alive. Yeah, we should do that in the name of human decency. But the truth of the matter is this is an enemy that's going to be stopped with one thing, brute force. That simply is what we're going to have to figure out how to do, do wisely. I don't celebrate that fact. Fighting is a horrible thing, and I want to tell you, it leaves a mark, a scar, even on the people who have fought a good fight. I know that. But I also know there are some enemies you can't talk out of not wanting to kill you. Rick, can we kill our way out of this, or does there have to be some kind of comprehensive strategy around social media? And what is it for that? Well, I mean, those are two separate issues. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we have to do a better job of understanding why and how social media is being effective. Uh, there is an Iman out there who I hope we can get on the show who's doing a great job in talking kids out of this, this willingness they have to go and fight with ISIS. I mean, he <laughs> says it's basically the same as a the kid wanting to join a gang. Mm -hmm. And he says there's more mental issues to this than people are giving it credit for. And he basically asks them some very sensible questions. And by the time he's done with them, they're beginning to realize how stupid they are for, for buying this. Um, so I think that's the better point of attack. You can't really stop social media, but sure. you can attack the people or deal with the people who are being reached by it. It's free, it's fast, it's easy. I guess, no, the question is, what's the appeal to join ISIS? Hey, it's not exactly easy to get over there. And then, what? well, what is not the a appeal religion? to anarchism, uh, uh, so revolutionary communism? I mean, these are relatively dead-end ideologies that nevertheless attract quite a bit of a following. And I would uh, actually link back to our, uh, our history in combating the Soviets in the sense that it, it had a military component, yes, but it also had a, an ideological component. We can't necessarily uh, stop this, uh, this, this problem by simply shutting it down or going after the venues where they broadcast on this sort of thing. We have to counter this message with a positive message, a, 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 an ideological message that is attractive to uh, democratic methods. Uh, the Washington Post ran a story last year that suggested that ISIS had as comparable favorable mentions on social media to France or China. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, appro it's approximately got that level of support. States aren't especially that popular. But ISIS is a state in that sense. Um, you have to have something that's uh, akin to a, a Voice of America that's not the State Department's Walk, Don't Run campaign. Something Do you think ISIS would be as big or perceived as dangerous as it is if social media didn't exist? In other words, it's all about fear and they could get images out quickly. It's, yes, it's the recruiting, but also all these horrible acts that they're committing and the massive beheadings and so on. I don't know if they would have risen as quickly as they have without that component. So I think that's the key. Would they have risen as quickly? Probably not. But people know how to get messages of hate out and they have from time immemorial. So I think we've got to be realistic. Could they have done it as well and as fast? No. Can it get out? out there, it can. I want to be clear, we cannot kill our way out of this, but we may have to do more killing than we're comfortable with. I heard Tommy Frank say something once, it was very powerful. He said, you, when it comes to terrorists, you must kill every last one. You must find them and you must kill them. It's a cancer. But you can't kill terrorism. 
Right. And that's an important distinction. My concern is the people who know we can't kill terrorism are not prepared to kill, and the people who want to kill don't understand that killing alone will not end this problem. So President Hirschfeld would send boots on the ground, U.S. boots on the ground? With a heavy heart and knowing what it does quite personally, yeah. How many would it take? I know you're not a military guy, but... I don't, I don't pretend to know. That's where you have to trust the military to get the job done. And again, with the caveat that you're doing the other culture-building stuff, the truth of the matter is the two prime examples in the 20th century of the United States defeating a horror were Japan and Germany, and it took two things, a willingness to kill lots of the enemy and then a rock-solid commitment to build up those cultures as soon as we were done with the killing. We're going to have to do both. No, you're for boots on the ground? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, again, reluctantly. I don't think there's any other option at this stage, unless we allow the this cancer, as it were, to metastasize mm -hmm. and possibly no longer be able to prevent it. Uh, the, the alternative is to allow a nascent Islamist caliphate in the Middle East that has reborn slavery, commits genocide, and destroys shared human heritage with abandon. Uh, the alternative is simply too horrible to think. And Rick, your Democratic friends probably wouldn't agree with you, but you've said well, on the show also that you would support that. On yeah, it's some level. it's a little more com com complex than that. It's not just a question of boots on the ground. It's a question of who and why we're sending people. Where do they need our people to augment the people who should be doing it on the, uh, at the outset, who are already in that region, and whether they're going to do it at all. It's a pretty complicated thing to approach. The problem that I have is, is that we're not planning any strategy considering any of these things, and that's where we're going seriously wrong. I'm just so surprised there hasn't been more of an international movement like there was with the, the Germans in World War II, seeing what these people are doing. Where, where countries like the Germanys of the world or like any European countries with, with decent militaries are saying, let's band together and let's get rid of this, but no one seems to want to lead on the we issue. We have an international coalition. It needs to be led. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. right. And so, Rick Perry is officially running for president again. We discuss. Don't go anywhere. Today, I am running for the presidency of the United States of America. And welcome back to The Wrap, and in a summer of sequels, we now offer Rick Perry, take two. That was the former governor of Texas announcing his 2016 run today, making him, counted up, the 10th Republican to jump into the race, probably get to about 16 or so. The big question, can he overcome his infamous 2012 oops moment? The third agency of government, yeah. I, would, I would do away with the education, uh, the... Uh, <laughs> commerce. I, I, commerce. And let's see. I can't. The third one, I can't. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. So, panel, do you think Republicans will give Mr. Perry a second chance? No, but it won't be because of the oops moment. And, and you know what? I'm so happy right now because all day long I have been asking the question, who are those two guys behind him? And right. Noah just told me. Yeah. Tell oh, everybody. the lone survivor guy. Yes. Right. The lone uh, survivor Marcus Luttrell guy. I kept going, right. who are those big guys? Yeah. I thought they were security or something. Well, why are they in the picture? <laughs> and Rick, to uh, off screen, but they showed a cutaway over at one point, the wife of American sniper, Chris Kyle. Oh, Kyle, is she? I uh, see. was there okay. as well. They're so. all supporting. Yeah, he's, I, I think Rick Perry is, is un unfortunately for him, probably yesterday's news. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a much better chance four years ago than he does today. There are just too many people there to steal his thunder now. Um, but again, I mean, I think he's forgiven for the oops moment. Even people like me who aren't big fans that, appreciate that's what's forgiven. that it happens. But you know, the, the impression that here comes another Texas governor who might not be, you know, the brightest light on the porch. <laughs> right. And I, I'm not saying that he isn't, but people automatically thought another Bush. Excuse me, I'm trying to get an interview with him tomorrow. <laughs> that did not Don't help. Don't kill I <laughs> No, I, I, I happen to think, well, let me ask you this. Okay. It's kind of a quirky question, but do you think he went with the Rachel Maddow glasses because he's trying to appear <laughs> smarter? I'm being serious. It's like he's rebranding himself, right? He's a different guy now. He's smarter. He looks good in this He life. is rebranding himself. But he doesn't have to. If anybody deserves a second chance, it's Rick Perry. He's the third three-term governor of one of the most successful nations in the state, mm -hmm. uh, a border guard that is really, and, and also the locus of the, the heart of the GOP. He really does deserve a second chance. Um, Job creation was impressive under his tenure. And he does. Uh, even, even I have to say it. He has the most successful employment record of any governor of in the country. Know. But you're right in that he probably won't, and I think you raised a really good point about his demeanor and his, uh, if you heard his speech today, it was full of Texasisms, nuclear, yeah. mm. and of, you know, a variety of uh, consign, resign when he may 
meant consigned. I mean, just little things that really irk a northern northeasterner, but uh, but don't necessarily for the rest of the country. So I, I, I think that would be a problem if he moved further. Yeah, Brett, I think what he's been doing the last four years was preparing for exactly what we saw today. Like, okay, there will be no oops moments. Right. I will come across as the the sharpest guy on the stage, and you know, it, people said he reminded him, or they reminded him of, or them of Reagan last time in terms of. In terms of the way he carries himself and kind of the guy who's out at the ranch and, you know, big governor, big state. Yeah, look, right? there's a folksiness, and that's appealing. But folksiness turns to foolishness pretty quickly with this guy. And I, and I don't know where that line is going to be. I think people are willing to forgive. I think one thing Americans consistently say on both sides, we want to be able to forgive. Mm -hmm. But you got to forgive in order to get something fresh and new, and I don't see it. Okay, so no shot for Rick Perry whatsoever, according to the Daily Rap panel. It appears Jeb Bush will formally get into the race with an announcement, and while Bush wants to get in, that's June 16th, I believe, Republican rival Marco Rubio is making some inroads with big donors. The Washington Post now reporting longtime Bush fundraisers are very impressed with Rubio and his vision, with some saying the 44-year-old senator has a more compelling story and offers a sharper generational contrast with Hillary Clinton. It's all about the money. Are some of the Republican bigwigs hedging their bets, Rick Unger? I'm sure they are. And, and Jeb Bush has not run a very good campaign the past few weeks. No, he so I'm sure that there are people, certainly down in Florida, taking a look at um, the, the, the younger fellow. Look, Jeb Bush uh, is going to be the nominee of the party. I mean, absent something dramatically happening. No, no, it doesn't agree. I know you like to gamble <laughs> but on set, is, but I, I could gam I'd love to bet that with and you right now and save the He's, the, the, he's the going to be please. it, I'm afraid. Um, but I, you know, again today, I would, I w could you talk to your friends in your party and tell them that we are tired of these big announcements about big announcements? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to make, make that the happen. darn announcement <laughs> and be done with it, you know? Yeah, is is, is Rubio the front runner right now? No, he's not. Um, but there is no front runner right now. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say he has as much of a chance of being the nominee as does Jeb Bush, as does Scott Walker. Um, probably those big three at this particular stage. It's a snapshot in time. I think Rubio's next. I yeah, think, I, I think it'll be so. somebody I mean, the else. The story that you re you mentioned was really compelling in that the, the, the big donor class is hedging their bets. Yeah. They're disappointed with Jeb. His donor network is a fifty year old uh, right. aging you know group, and, but and they have all the Rubio's money. trying to go for this grassroots you know swell. So I think that might be actually pretty compelling. Brad, last word. Young, first term senator, charismatic, smart. Does it remind you of anyone? I actually think there's a real shot. The Republican Party is ready for its version of Barack Obama. We'll see what happens. We will see what happens. And we have 524 days to discuss. Outstanding. <laughs> Coming up next, Hillary's questions clock keeps growing again. And Bernie Sanders wants more debates, if that's possible. Stay tuned. And welcome back to the Daily Wrap. Well, 2016 Democratic hopeful Bernie Sanders wants to debate early and often. The Democratic National Committee now agreeing to sanction six debates starting in the fall. But Sanders has started a petition calling for more debates and for them to start this summer. Oh, God, please let that happen. And he also wants some Republicans to participate as well. That's very interesting. It's like the, uh, you know, Major League Baseball. The American and National League never played each other. Now he's trying to do interleague. Cool. Anyway, is this a good idea? What is, I think the answer is pretty easy. What's I, Sanders' I, strategy? It is, yeah, I You're understand what, you debate. yeah, but you know what? He is actually offering a public service. I love the ideas of the Democrats and the Republicans, the candidates, not the ones who end up winning. I love them getting together in a debate. We might all actually learn something. I think it's a great idea. I love the ratings that it would bring. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine you have Ted Cruz Only if we get Bernie the Newsmax Sanders. debate. Right. Oh, of course. Well, uh, you would moderate that. I would mix them all up, man. Put them on the stage. I couldn't agree more. Cruz Sanders. Just picture it. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, we, we have that debate. It's called C-SPAN 2. All you have to do is turn we on the don't. Senate and you can uh, see these no. characters debate. No, there's absolutely there's nothing There's a C-SPAN 2? Well, there are. There's actually three. Uh, there's, there's nothing to be gained from a intramural <laughs> debate besides sniping at each other, partisan jabs, and no clarification as to what actu people How actually you know? stand on. How because, you know? because no, again, because I'm telling thing. you, we see By this way, every the day. The one just party debates do the same yeah, thing. That's exactly I right. think What's why it would difference? be interesting is they would actually go after each other, right. not dilute their own party, and you'd have a better sense of who these candidates were when they ultimately ran against each and other the really in the general. And the really good ones might actually provide some substance to impress them. 
right. And for Sanders, I think it's a no-brainer. He's an underdog. He gets more exposure. He's smart. He's funny. He's the grumpy <laughs> old grandfather. It's a, primary, primary. it's a primary debate. You wouldn't see substance. What you'd see is these one side trying to impress their voters by being as aggressive, <laughs> as snarky, as snipey as they possibly can and trying to Maybe. get applause yes. from their side because they're winning a primary race and, and not no, in general. It, it, it would I be so try. entertaining for us selfishly. Wouldn't that be tremendous to try. watch? It would advance nothing. <laughs> 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 but boy, that's a good hour and a half, two fun, hours, yeah. right? I say, You're way pushing to go over to Bernie. his side. Way to go, Bernie. <laughs> so keep so up how, the good suggestions. Seriously, Brad, uh, how, do we, how do we make this happen? What, what sort of swell would have to push this into actually happening? Well, the two things would have to happen. You have to convince the party they would be better off attacking the other guys than their own candidates, because mm -hmm. that would make for a better general election. And then, actually, I think people do like good theaters. We have to go out and tell you this would be the best free show on Earth, so let's get it happen. The problem is that I have a feeling, and this is just a feeling, that Hillary Clinton wouldn't agree to something like this. <laughs> if, she, if she didn't, it'd be her loss. You think so? Oh, goodness, yes. If she chose not to participate... Oh, yeah. well, terrible. No, not participate. She would just, behind the scenes, say, I'm not doing well, this. Well, she won't say that in front of the scenes. And mm -hmm. if it were to come to pass, and she says, I'm taking a pass on this... Oh. Death to her own Absolutely. peril. I can Absolutely. picture the chair with the ticking yes. clock with yes. all the hours if that have gone by. Sanders no questions. Bernie Sanders wants his own underdog debate, and he wants to invite Republicans to participate. Carly Fiorina, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Rick Perry, people who aren't really I'll pulling very well. That. They will probably participate. It'll Great. be a spectacle, Good. and all the individuals who are not See? who are doing well in the polls won't participate. But it, it, that that could happen. That could happen exactly. The, the Fox debate, you have to be in the top ten in terms of polling. So you take the. 14 that don't make it out of the 24 that are going to run, and then you put you them what, all up against Bernie and O'Malley. I will be the, well, maybe not the first, but I will certainly be writing about what chicken you know what's those other candidates are because they're afraid to they're, face a different smart. point they of view. No incentive. <laughs> okay, we have to move on. Former Republican turned independent and now turned Democrat, Lincoln Chafee. He joined the 2016 race, and Brad is can't wait to talk about <laughs> this, and I think the metric system may come up. And during a question and answer session with his announcement, he opened the door to actually negotiating with ISIS. ISIS is emerging. I mean, it's a, it's a phenomenon that's ever-changing. I mean, I think everybody's surprised what's happening in Palmyra right now. Uh, expected the devastation of the antiquities that hasn't happened. And so I think we're coming to grips of understanding exactly who these people are and what they want. So, Brad, where exactly would an ISIS conversation happen? Do you meet in Damascus? Do you kind of go over into Fallujah? Right. Where, 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 where do we do this? this? What I do credit him for is he, is he has now become the person who's made me appreciate Bernie Sanders more deeply. <laughs> yeah. And I really, look, I want to be clear if you want to understand it. There wasn't massive destruction in Palmyra when they took the city for one and only one reason. The remains in Palmyra are largely Roman period. They are not Christian. Any place ISIS shows up, they devastate any Christian site. If There's he thinks that's when you can talk with, they're crazy. Now, long term, the people you kill today may be the people you negotiate with tomorrow. But right now, ISIS is constituted. No, it's not people you sit down and talk with. Doesn't no, work well, I wouldn't say that, that the ruins are safe. Yeah. Uh, they've destroyed some Assyrian ruins as well. But it's interesting that his first place he went to, and the pusillanimousness here is, is fascinating. The first place he went to is the antiquities. Oh, the, the poor antiquities. <laughs> we have the human toll that is positively enraging and shocking, and that we would preemptively surrender is just absolute cowardice. What do you think about the whole metric system platform? <laughs> I am, I'm all about the platform. All, I'm all about the metric system. What is this guy? This guy's Meshuggah, as we say. <laughs> he Meshuggah. He, I mean, it's a technical term. And by the way, he just wanted us to know he knew what Palmyra was. And and the antiquities weren't destroyed because they're going to start selling them. Well, he, That's what they do. He, he has my vote it's because, on, again, when I could go to McDonald's and say I want a Royale with cheese, oh. that is a very good day. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. potluck time is next. Do not go anywhere. And welcome back to Daily Wrap. Potluck time, part of the show we go around the table and share our favorite stories of the day. First, let's show you the Hillary clock. Yes, it's back with a vengeance. If you remember last time, Hillary Clinton went over 40,000 minutes without answering a question from the press. And then she answered a couple, almost kind of forced into it by, by Fox's Ed Henry and then, then others uh, joined in. She answered about uh, questions for about five minutes. Well, it's been a long time since that happened. And now she is at 19,000 so minutes. Uh, I guess what's the over-under you think it's going to get to before she starts answering questions again, Brett Hirschfeld? 
thirty thousand. Okay, very good. Quickly. That's good. I'm going to say forty five thousand. Forty five thousand. You should do what they do in the Price Is Right, where you go thirty thousand yeah, and that's one. Yeah, right. Go all right. <laughs> I'm just disgusted with the whole thing. Okay, very good. And uh, quickly, before we get to the potluck, uh, new poll out today, which I found fascinating. Seven in ten Democrats say it is not a done deal that Hillary Clinton wins the Democratic nomination. Seven in ten. And only 28% say she's got it locked up and that's it. So, I guess, Rick, I... Shows you what brilliant political <laughs> prognosticators the public is. <laughs> so you're at 100% then. I, who's going to beat her? That's I mean, you may not like it, but who's going to beat her? Precisely right. Okay, Brad, let's get to your potluck. Enough well, it's there. a potluck that connects to the Clinton Foundation, and they're not going to answer any questions about that because they answer questions about nothing. But I think it's actually a nice story about the Clinton Health Access Initiative. They received a gift of between one and ten million dollars, and that's how philanthropic gifts get reported. So my guess is it's probably a million because no one gives to the high end of the bracket. So probably a million dollars from the Cameroon Baptist Convention's Health Board. That's an interesting gift to the health initiative from the Clintons. This is a health, a Cameroon Baptist community that says that homosexuality is equivalent to bestiality and to incest. They believe that gay marriage will destroy the world and bring God's wrath upon us. And people are now mocking the Clintons for receiving their money. I actually think it's to both the Clintons' credit and the church's credit for having done this. Here's the thing. People can fight about ideology all they want. They can have any opinion they want about homosexuality, about same-sex marriage, about God and the lack of God in the world. In the end, the giving and the receiving of this gift is a testament to two parties' willingness to come together beyond the bounds of ideology to do one thing, help keep kids in Africa healthier. And I think that's a real, in fact, if I think about it a little bit more, I would say I wish we had people in Congress that were able to do this. Have any ideology you want. Sing it from the rooftops. But at the end of the day, just like we have evidence-based medicine, we ought to have evidence-based policy and evidence-based legislation. Are you in it so you can trumpet your ideology, or are you there so you can make a positive difference in people's lives? So while I agree with neither the Clintons nor the Cameroon Baptist Health Initiative, I actually congratulate them both for being willing to go past their ideology to do something good in the world for kids. That was articulate. Yeah. That was lucid. You really should think about getting into a whole sermon thing where you actually <laughs> preach these, these sort of things. You I think I just did, rabbi. didn't I? No, I'd much rather do this. <laughs> You're a much better congregation. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Mr. Runger, the floor is yours. Well, let's, uh, as most people know now, uh, in the past couple of days, Senator Ted Cruz, a candidate for the Republican nomination, was making a campaign speech, and he included the following joke. Let's show it to people. Vice President Joe Biden. You know the nice thing? You don't need a punchline. I, I promise you it works. The next party you're at, just walk up to someone, say Vice President Joe Biden, and just close your mouth. Well, because that was virtually impossible to understand, the joke was actually. I don't, do you remember the joke? It was if it, you walk up to somebody at a party oh, yeah, and you say, "My friend say, Joe Bryan," people you don't just even come have to up. say anything else because they'll start laughing. No punchline required. As we all know, Senator uh, Vice President Biden lost his son. Uh, I think it was Saturday night, and his funeral is coming up this weekend. When I saw that, I was reminded of a few things. The first was a couple years ago, a, a gentleman by the name of Andrew Breitbart passed away. Young man, uh, very conservative, had, has a, had a very successful conservative publication that still goes on, although he obviously is not with it any longer. And many of my fellow liberals seem to get great pleasure out of making fun of the fact that Andrew Breitbart had passed away. And, and I was just thoroughly disgusted. Andrew Breitbart, whether you agreed with his politics or not, A, happened to have been a pretty good guy, and more importantly, he has a family who was in enormous pain having lost a husband and a father. And I, I remember writing about this and castigating those on my side of the aisle for behaving in such a brutal way. How Senator Cruz could get up there and do this just absolutely amazes me. I don't want to politicize it, but I do want to say that if he were my son, I'd be absolutely ashamed of him. 
It may have been part of his stump speech, but you know, you don't have to be that clever to understand. Maybe you take it out. It just was so sad. He did apologize afterwards. He did correct? apologize, yeah. but I don't know how it happens in the first place. Yeah, agreed, agreed. He's got to be smarter than that. Smartest guy in the room, but not very smart there. More Daily Wrap in a moment. It's happy time, people. Welcome back to Daily Wrap. Time for yay or nay. First up, we spoke earlier about how ISIS makes its living off of recruitment via social media. Well, as they say, live by the Twitter, die by the Twitter. Check out this photo as this ISIS idiot posted a selfie online, not realizing that their Syrian headquarters was featured prominently in the background. But who's checking the ISIS Twitter account, right? Well, pretty much everybody, including the United States military. Fast forward about 22 hours later when the U.S. Air Force promptly dropped a few metric tons of bombs on the aforementioned terror group's headquarters in Syria, taking out the entire building and everything in it. Are morons taking selfies the break we need in the fight against ISIS, Brad Hirschfield? I don't think it's the break we need, but it's very useful. And it's not the first time it was done. It was actually done in the Gaza War this summer by Israel as well. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the selfie we showed, I think, was just an example of a selfie. Oh, okay. But no, it wasn't. Right. It was that one, like hit that, not yeah. much use well, in that. it was a third-person yeah. omniscient perspective, too. <laughs> <laughs> You're <laughs> sort of hovering above the uh, selfie taker. Yes, yes. So this is story. not a smart enemy. We're a, this is really a, quite a bunch of unsophisticated individuals. The fact that we're losing this war is absolutely <laughs> remarkable, <laughs> considering how imbecilic they are. I can't point. believe I'm losing to this guy. Oh, man. See? That's like <laughs> to caucus uh, Saturday yeah. Night Live yeah, against yeah, Bush. Yeah. 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 I knew yeah. that. I didn't get the reference. Yeah. Next, <laughs> nothing like because you weren't born yet. That's why you don't get the reference. Anyway, <laughs> next, serious. nothing beats a fine evening at the culinary carnival that is Taco Bell. And now the world, or at least Chicago, will never be the same. Now that the chain will be serving alcohol. If you live in the Windy City area, you will soon be able to get a beer with your gordita crunch. I don't go to Taco Bell, so I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. As Taco Bell begins serving beer, wine, and mixed alcohol freezes. Nor Noah's kind of drinks, actually. Okay. And it, that's all at the new Chicago location. At this time, there's no word on ideas for improving its plumbing infrastructure, according to several Newsmax sources who ought to know. Alcohol at Taco Bell, Mr. Unger, or alcohol expert. It's okay with me, but if they actually use tequila and mix it with that stuff, they're going to have a big problem. Yeah, very good point. You no. can't do that. I thought all those looked really good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I don't think I'm a huge <laughs> fan of Taco Bell, but that looked really great. I would, uh, I would get into a freezy alcohol beverage. <laughs> Quite a combination, Brad. Listen, anything that helps the food go down, <laughs> <laughs> By all means, when they start doing tequila shots, then call me. I'll yeah, take it then out. you're okay. That, as that long would be as they good. Keep it right, pure. good tequila keep shots. Pure. Call me, which we'll be doing in exactly three minutes. There you go. A 19-year-old Pennsylvania man who isn't a police officer, mind you, set up his own DUI checkpoint <laughs> early and actually pulled over several confused people early as an early Saturday morning. Why? Because he always wanted to fight crime, perhaps? No, not quite. This teen, Logan Chalice, identified himself to drivers as Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania State Police Trooper Steve Rogers, who also happens to be the name of Ricky... Captain America. Captain America. We did not rehearse that. Captain America, yes. Mr. Shalis pulled out all the stops in the ruse. He had flares, he had a BB gun, handcuffs, and even a portable scanner. One major problem with this plan, besides getting caught, was that the was overserved <laughs> at the time which actually makes perfect sense. So he's a drunk guy pulling over potential right, drunk, drunk people. Guys. Now the DUI crime fighter faces a string of charges, and that includes, get your pencil ready, carrying a firearm without a license, driving under the influence of alcohol, unlawful restraint, rec reckless endangerment, impersonating a public servant, harassment, disorderly conduct, and public drunkenness. Okay, so forget about impersonating an officer and public drunkenness. Should Shalis face life in prison? for impersonating Captain America. <laughs> I love Captain America growing up, but no. Okay. No. He's a minor, no. But do you remember when you were young enough to get drunk and do all that stuff? <laughs> Who does anything now? You're just, you're just drunk, out, right? go to sleep. What do you mean when you were young enough? But yeah, go ahead, Rick. Well, it depends. If he's impersonating Steve Rogers before he was hit with the gamma rays that bulked him up, mm -hmm. then that's yeah, okay, because he looks like the, the weenie Steve Rogers. If he really thought he was Captain America, he needs... 
Do you think he just came up with Steve Rogers just as a name and he didn't even know it was Captain America's? Generationally, Everybody he probably does. should know. You oh, think yeah. so? Everybody knows who Steve Rogers okay. is. Not that you're biased that. in that regard. Well, I am a little biased. <laughs> anyway, panel, thanks so much. Uh, Thank you. Testosterone was overwhelming tonight. <laughs> that will never happen again. Thank you for joining us, everyone. I'm Joe Concha, Newsmax Prime, J.D. Hayworth. That's next.